uh, I'm a physics teacher in a public secondary school in Nigeria. Uh, the name of my school is Iju Senior Grammar School. And of course, it's located in an underserved community. Um, I'm a Fulbright Fellow, like you also know, a Fulbright Fellow just the same way Mr. Hare Krishna is. I'm also a Commonwealth alumni. So my master's degree was actually with a Commonwealth scholarship, and that was in 2019. I am one of the top 10 educators based on the 2021 Wakelet Community Impact Award. Then also for 2021, I was one of the top 60 teachers based on the Cambridge Press Dedicated Teachers Award. And of course, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and I'm also a team counselor. So in my church, I counsel teens, and also in school, I counsel teens. Okay, so my school, like I said, is in an underserved community. So we have students coming from very poor homes and they have parents who are illiterate or semi-literate. And the population of my school, the strength stands at over 2000. And for a school in an underserved community, you can know that most of the time the facilities are barely adequate with the kind of population we have, but we have to make do with what we have. Then to ensure that teaching and learning is impactful, despite the challenges we might pass through in teaching this large population with little resources at our disposal, I had to employ some innovative techniques. And some of those techniques are what I'm going to talk about today. Okay. So innovation is more or less doing something new to bring more impact or doing something that you have been doing before in a different and novel way in, in, in a bit to get more impact. So one of the innovative methodologies or innovative strategies I employed is using technology enhanced learning as in leveraging on technology to maximize the student's learning experience. And I had to go out of my way to provide some of these resources for myself. For example, I have to provide data by myself because definitely the government will not provide for that. But I had to do all of this because I wanted my students to really understand most of the things I was saying. And I wanted to prepare students for the future. conversant with technology. So that was what, why I decided to leverage on technology. And I made use of edutech tools such as Wicklet. I don't know whether we use Wicklet in India, but Wicklet is one edutech tool I use because it, I can use it in lieu with WhatsApp. And students from my school have, um, they don't have very expensive uh, handsets. They just have simple uh, smartphones and they don't have much um, resources to buy data. I know WhatsApp uses little data and Wakelet works beautifully with it. So I use Wakelet for kind of like flip learning, everything I want to teach in school. I get videos, I get simulations, I get text, I get pictures. I put it on the Wakelet page and send a link to WhatsApp. So even before when they come to school, you already understand what I'm going to teach. So it's more or less like a walkover when we come to school. Then I also use another app I call Kahoot. I'm sure we use Kahoot or Quizlet in India too. So Kahoot is more like a gaming tool. So for students who actually learn, it has to be fun. If it's not fun, they're not gonna learn. If science is boring, nobody's gonna learn. So I use gaming to kind of engage them and make the teaching fun and interactive. So that's one thing I also do. Another thing I make sure is that despite the fact I'm using technology, pedagogy should drive technology. It's not just, I want to use Wakelet, I want to use this. The essential feature is the pedagogy. What do I want to pass across? And then I'll now know which technology will be suitable to pass the learning or the teaching I want to pass across. Then the next thing is that I don't necessarily have to invent the wheel. And what I mean by that is I don't have to start making videos. 
there's a whole lot of videos, there's a whole lot of animations, there's a whole lot of simulations on the internet. So all I need to do is just search for one that is suitable for any lesson I have and just modify and make use of it. Then I make use of fun and interesting OER. OER means open educational resource, educational resources that are free and bite-sized because I'm going to put them on WhatsApp and explainer videos and animations. And the reason why I do this is because I understand that students love watching things that are fun. For example, students love cartoons. So what a better way to teach periodic table than to turn it into an animation. Students like watching videos. What a better way to teach a concept instead of talking and talking and talking. You can use explainer videos that students can relate to it. Then I make use of a universal learning design. So a universal learning design is in three forms. It means multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of assessment. So I'll start with the multiple means of representation. What do I mean by that? I can, the, the teaching is the same. The concept is the same but there are different ways to present it. I have this understanding that I have different learners in my class. Every child has their own individual differences. Every child learns differently. Some learn by just what they see text. Some learn as you teach. Some need to see something visual. They need animations, they need videos. Some need the real object, that's the real idea. And some can learn using simulations. So anytime I want to prepare a lesson, I have this in mind, that for every lesson, there must be multiple means of representation. So every child has his own means of learning. And inside that lesson, the child can actually pick which mean is easier for him to understand. So in each lesson, you have multiple means of representation. That's one way to make sure students learn the sciences and learn it very well. I'm sure you would recognize this one. The simulation here is um, is this fat simulation. It's fat simulation. And those of us that are Fulbright teachers, I think we saw this when we went to America. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Okay, so there are various sites from which you can access these materials. You don't need to start building new materials. And even as students too, we can go to these different sites. For the beginning of the term, like the way we do it in Nigeria, students are given the curriculum for the term. So you have those topics. So you can actually visit some of these sites and look for these topics. So you already have an inside view into what your teacher is going to teach you. You can visit Khan Academy. You can use BBC Bite Size. You can use YouTube. There are various videos on different concepts on YouTube. You can also use the FAT simulation. This one is very good for science students, especially when you don't have a lab. You can actually see those physical concepts come to life using these sites. Okay, so that's for multiple means of representation. So I also make use of multiple means of expression. Every child expresses learning in a different way. It's not until you tell a student, okay, what is an atom? And the students can raise up his hand and talk that he has understood. Students can represent or express what they have learned in different ways. Some can express it by actually building something. That's where project learning comes to play. Some students can express what they have learned by actually speaking. Some can express what they have learned by actually acting it out. So in teaching students, I also make use of multiple means of expression, understanding that every child has a different way of expressing the learning they have imbibed. Then of course, the next one is multiple means of assessment. And I think um, for most of um, under developing countries, let me use that. Uh, we have a long way to go here and even every other country. Uh, we are always uh, focused on standardized tests, exam, root learning, okay, what is an atom, write it exactly the way I said, which shouldn't be, because we are just building robots instead of people that can actually express themselves. So there should be multiple means of represent uh, assessment. It doesn't only have to be 
through standardized tests. It could be with a project you gave a student to do. Okay, build this to show me you understand the concept that I have taught. So that's what multiple means of assessment mean. And this is a beautiful thing I noticed in my masters in, in the UK. They always use multiple means of assessment. For example, your assignment most of the time is, they actually ask you to pick an assignment that is suitable for you. And it must show that you have imbibed the lesson that covered for probably one or two weeks. So multiple means of assessment is the way to go. I can see some hands raised. Should I answer them now or after? You can you can answer. You can answer to their questions after your presentation. They just okay. have. Okay. 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 So let's move on. So the next, you know, the first thing I said is using technology enhancers. And the next one is connection-based learning which you are doing so beautifully too. Mm -hmm. I can I watch you on Facebook and I see you are doing that too. I also do that. I think since 2018, I have started it. And what is connection-based learning? It's a pedagogical approach where teachers connect their students to experts, to communities, to organizations, so that they can learn from one another, which is a beautiful thing because now, the world is a global village. And the sooner teachers get that, imbibe that, and begin to tell students and show them this is a global village, the better for every one of us. So that is what I also do. And it has given my students um, access to talk to other students in other parts of the world. For example, in 2018, 2019, we had my students connecting with students in America. They did STEM projects together. They read books together. They were sending videos to one another. And it kind of boosts the, the self-image of a child, especially most of these children here that come from very poor homes. Imagine saying, ah, my friend is in America. I have a best friend in America. We discussed about this book. We made this project together. All these children now that you see, they are pretty young, but now they are already in the university. They are doing wonderfully well. I found out that project and that uh, connection-based learning boosted their morale and made them understand that they were global citizens, made them social innovators, made them empathic people. So connection-based learning is also another thing I do. Okay, the major one, you know, I'm a science teacher, is project-based learning. Um, education that does not produce anything is useless. If it's just bookish, you just read, write exam, and that is it. It is useless. Education must have a product. Education is to solve problems. So if the education we are getting cannot solve any problem, then it's totally useless. So most of the time, most of my teaching is based on project-based learning. And yes, students identify and solve problems within their communities. And they make use of the concepts that have been taught in class. Okay, we talked about electricity. How do I apply that to my community? We talked about renewable energy and I don't have light at home. How can I make sure I have light at home? So that is what we do, project-based learning. And this has actually brought my school to limelight. Uh, one of the pictures here, this one here is uh, a smart house. You can't really see it from here. It's a self-powered smart house. Self-powered in the sense that it's powered using renewable energy and it's smart in the sense that it has ultrasonic sensor. It has a whole lot of things inside of it. It can tell you the humidity around the house. It can tell you the temperature around the house. And these were projects that were built by students based on what they have learned in the class. And for this project they built, and my school got the first place position in a Chevron competition. And they were even the first public school to get the first place position in this kind of competition. They have won several awards. They have won awards for Nigerian Society of Engineers in 2019, 2020, 2021. And also Beyond School Challenge, there are a whole lot of awards they have won based on this way of learning. Okay, then I'm also passionate about girls in STEM. In Nigeria, we have, um, if you compare the number of females in STEM, and when I say STEM, I mean science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, 
if you compare the number of female professionals in STEM to men, it is very disheartening. You can say it's like maybe 20 to 80 percent. And I'm always passionate about girls being proactive in STEM. So I set up an initiative which is called Girls Pro STEM. And what I what do I do here? What I do here is to run after school classes for girls, STEM classes for girls, and also run mentors, mentorship programs for them, where I connect them with professionals who are females and who are trailblazers in their respective pro professions. Now, the one down here is one of my student, Grace, and she was selected for a UNESCO program. Okay, this one is a UNICEF program. The one down is a UNICEF program. And the one up, Mweke Chizoba, was selected for a UNESCO program, which is actually girls can crack the code for gifted girls. So using these innovative technologies has helped me raise up students that are innovative thinkers and change makers. Okay, so the last slide here, I'm not going to, I don't know how I'm going to rephrase it because I actually thought I was going to speak to teachers, not students, but I believe everyone can learn from this. So my advice to 21st century students is that be open to learning. We will learn until we die. So be open to learning. Unlearn, there's some things you have to unlearn, there's some things you have to relearn because knowledge is not static, it's moving. Then have a growth mindset. Don't have a fixed mindset, have a growth mindset. Always want to be better than your yesterday. Always want to be better than what you have been before. Always have a growth mindset. Always want to be more. Then the next one, collaborate. The 21st century is not for going alone. If you want to go far, and now they say if you want to go far, fast. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. And besides team, the word team means together, everyone achieves much. So in the 21st century, you need to collaborate. You have to learn how to collaborate, learn how to communicate, learn how to collaborate. The next of all, follow people who inspire you to be more. You look like the people you follow. So choose your mentors wisely. Choose your idols, so to say, wisely. Follow people who will inspire you to be more then be the change that you want to see. We know there's a lot of things that are wrong with the world as it is, but you can be the change that you want to see. It can actually start from you. Then last of all, seek knowledge. That's one thing you need to do. Seek knowledge, seek information for yourself. There's a lot of opportunities out there. There are a lot of scholarships out there. Seek knowledge and seek information and God will help us all. So I think I will just stop here for now and I'll take questions. Well, Stephanie, I have no words to express uh, my thankfulness to you because the way you are working with your community, with your students is absolutely invaluable, outstanding, really speaking, so outstanding. Much. Because uh, the work that you are, I have just gone through some of your practices at your classroom. So what was so interesting for me is multiple way of representation. That means you keep all the students depending on their caliber of ability, listening capacities. And how do you design the lesson plan for these kids of different types of abilities? Because as a teacher, practically speaking, I cannot mold myself to teach all kinds of students. Of course, I have two types of students. One is uh, average student, another one is slow learner. So in that case, I have two strategies to implement at the same time. But you have shared with me, that means you have different kinds of students, you have different lesson plans for them. How can you try no, it? it yeah. Okay, I have I have one lesson plan. Then under the strategy and activities, you know, we have section of activities. Now on that section of activities, I have marked out the activities for each kind of learner. Mm. You understand? So on yeah. those activities, okay, I'm going to show a video. 
I'm going to use a simulation. I'm going to talk for a while. We're going to interact for a while. I'm going to give them questions to answer. I'm going to use a game to round it up. So all those activities are already on the lesson plan. Mm. So that means you must have been doing a lot of work, I think, before you walk to the classroom. There must be some homework need to be done, am I right? Yes, 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 of course. Of and that's why I had to use Wakelet. So most of the workers, I've actually given it to them the night before. So they have seen it. So when mm. we come to class, it's more or less to interact mm -hmm. and find out how far you have learned. What don't you understand? Okay, let's yeah. use this. Let's use that. And mm. we we'll carry everyone along. So one more thing that uh, I was really amazed with your work with the girls uh, in order to uh, educate the girls uh, in, uh, towards the STEM education, because you said that the girls' percentage in the STEM area is uh, not uh, as, uh, yes. as, it is, as it is supposed to be. And uh, that's also a really commendable job as a teacher. And I hope that uh, you will succeed in your effort uh, to mobilize the girls towards the STEM education. So I would like to give the opportunity, a golden opportunity to some of my students to pose you some questions. Uh, okay. Bhagasri, Bhagasri, please go ahead and ask your question. And this is a great opportunity, Bhagasri, uh, to in fact be an outstanding teacher from African continent. Hello, ma'am. Hello, how are you doing? Fine, ma'am. Okay. My name is Bhagasri. I'm studying eighth grade. My hobbies are reading books and playing games. Shall I ask one question, ma'am? Yes, you can. We heard that you are promoting STEM education among the girls. What institutions are spons sponsoring your brilliant girls? Okay, so when I started, um, I started with um, one organization called WOW Foundation. And what, found, what WOW Foundation is all about is advancing the cause of STEM for women in Nigeria and in Africa. So what WOW Foundation did for me was to provide a platform whereby these female students can get training. For example, they got training in 3D printing, they got training in building renewable energy projects and all that. So the first organization I worked with was WOW Foundation. And even for my connecting classroom programs, it was still this WOW Foundation that connected me with another organization in, U in USA, which is Level Up Village, that has also been helping to pro promote STEM in, in girls in Nigeria. Currently, I'm also working with other organizations. Presently, I've worked with STEMI Africa, which is also another organization that promotes STEM education in Nigeria. Really great efforts, Stephanie. You are the really inspirational to many students. Nagalakshmi, over to you. Yes, sir. Hi, ma'am. This is Nagalakshmi, eighth grader. Okay. My hobbies are reading and playing games. My future ambition is to become an English teacher. I am honored okay. to speak with you. Can I ask one question, ma'am? Of course you can. We have heard that you have engaged your students in many innovative projects. Could you please explain about that briefly? Okay, so I said education that does not solve a problem is useless if it's just bookish knowledge and it doesn't do anything. So some of the projects I did was based on the concepts of thought in class. For example, I teach renewable energy in the class and I expect you to do a project. And one of the projects my students did was to make a self-powered house. And what's a self-powered house? A house that is not connected to the national grid but can produce its own energy by itself. And they even went a step further even to make the house even smart. So, that is some of the projects they have done. They have also done projects on water treatment. You know, water pollution is a problem in even in Nigeria. So they have done projects on water treatment. They have done projects on waste management. And what they actually did was to do a smart bin. And what's a smart bin? A dustbin whereby you don't need to touch it. You just need to come very close to it. And what happens? It opens up, you can throw your waste and uh, whatever into it and go away. And of course they use Arduino to make that. So they are using science principles to actually address 
societal and environmental program. So those are just some of the examples of some of the projects you have done. Stephanie, uh, I have a request for you. I think you have been doing a really a great job with your students. So is it possible to include some of my bright students in the project uh, so that to the your your students and my students can come together and work together and uh, in designing these innovative projects is it possible in the future of course it's possible and there are even so many other opportunities out there there is a stem alliance program going on right now so it has to do with a whole lot of countries not just nigeria moldovia cameroon so i can actually drop the link for you so your students can collaborate with other students across the world in building projects. And it's not even very serious projects, start from simple projects and grow up and make more innovative projects. So yeah. later on, I can drop the link for you too. Definitely. Sai Surya, what to you? Help him. Uh, so his, he, what he's going to ask is, what he's trying to ask is, who inspired you to become a physical science teacher? It's my mom. <laughs> my mom was a chemistry teacher and she was phenomenal. She was one of the best chemistry teachers in her time. I watched her break down chemical concepts and it does look so easy. So just watching her alone was enough to inspire me. Mm. So you must be lucky enough to have such a great mother and a teacher yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Teja, over to you. Yes, sir. Hi, ma'am. Hello, how are you doing? I am fine, ma'am. Okay. My name is Varun Teja. I am studying eighth grade. I am from India. Okay. I can ask one question, ma'am. Yes, of course you can. How do you teach physical science innovatively? Okay, so I kind of explained it as I was going through my slides, was that I use a universal learning design. I use a universal learning design because I understand that I have some students that are extremely good, I have some students that are in between, I have some students that are not too good. And I have some students that appeal to visuals I have some students that appeal to audio. I have some students that I just need to interact with. So to ensure that I carry everyone along, I use different means of representation, different means of assessment, different means of expression to ensure that everyone understands what I am teaching. Then and most importantly, I make sure my teaching is fun. No one likes a boring teacher. I had a very boring physics teacher. I think that's what made me become a teacher. The, for students to learn, it must be fun, it must be engaging, it must be productive. So that's how I teach. So Stephanie, as, you, as we know that in the Indian traditional classrooms, most of the physical science teachers, they, they don't take their kids to the lab and for any kind of experiments because I, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a kid, I... I uh, I actually, as a kid, I, I was uh, not exposed to too many, uh, I mean, experiments uh, when I was there in the school. The physical science teachers uh, didn't do any experiment, even one experiment uh, in the whole academic year. And uh, so you, as a physical science teacher, you cannot create any kind of scientific temper among the students if you don't involve the students in such uh, experiments, personally. Yes, yes. So, though I am not a, a physical science teacher, uh, I personally feel that. So many science teachers in India, they do like that. That's why most of the students, they feel uh, it's a really hard uh, to understand the physical science. They try to um, skip the, from the physical science classes rather than showing. But, but I, 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 I also saw that in America, when I went to America, there was no physics class. And I was wondering what's happening. <laughs> there was no physics class. I had to join. I was attached with forensics class. And they were all running from the physical sciences. And I would say they are no bad students. You know what they tell us now is that we have bad teachers. So we have to, we have to innovate. We have to grow. We have to change, has to understand and be part of it. 
I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes. Sruti, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Hello, ma'am. Hello. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Sruti, a seventh grade student. May I pose you a question? Of course, you can. Could you please tell us your contribution to your students during the period of pandemic? Okay. So during the period of pandemic, we had to go online. And that was what we are, we are not even doing before. It was uh, something totally new. And we had to change with the times. And I noticed that, like I said, my students come from underserved community. So we couldn't use things like Google Classroom. Where was the data? We couldn't use things like Microsoft Teams. We will not have students. So we had to use WhatsApp to teach our students. So what I actually did then, because you know it's online, if they were in class face-to-face, -face, it would have been easy to have more interaction. So what I did to ensure I didn't lose my students during that time was to make animations. I actually had to go and learn how to make animations. So I had to animate most of what I wanted to teach and put it on WhatsApp so that students were always eager. What is mom going to put on WhatsApp next time? Students were always eager to join the class and see what I was going to teach. So that was what I did during the pandemic period to ensure that I didn't lose my students and to ensure that students were still learning. Hello, Aram. My hobbies are reading books, playing games, and watching TV. My future ambition is to become an English teacher. I feel privileged to speak with you. Can I ask you a question? Of course you can. Would you mind explaining about interpersonal relationship of your students? Okay. So, um, it's something I've come to learn and that you can't teach any student unless you reach the student. So the student must first of all, see you as a friend before they can actually listen to you. So I always make sure I try to make students my friend. And if you come to my school, you have students all around me everywhere. In fact, they, they are called my bodyguards. They are always with me. So I always make sure I have a good relationship with my students. Because it's only when you have a good relationship with them, that is when they will respect you, that is when they will be ready to listen to you, and that's when they'll be comfortable enough to share whatever is bothering them with you. So always have a good relationship with my students. So that's the, that's the best quality that the teacher should have, because if you are, if you maintain the distance, if you are, if you, if you put on the serious face, nobody like yeah. you. As it, no, uh, but there are some times, you know, there are some times you actually have to put on the serious face. And there are some times you need to lose a note too. So yeah, after all, as we a are teacher, women, you should be able to emotion. know when to, <laughs> you know when to put on which face and at what time. Yes. Josh uh, Mado, it's your, your, your turn. Hi, ma'am. My name is Josh Mado. Hi, ma'am. My name is Josh Mada. I'm studying eighth grade. My hobbies are reading books, playing games. Can I ask one question, ma'am? Of course you can, Josh. How do you deal with those students who are not good at physical science? Okay. Um, I don't believe any student is not good at anything. I just believe that I've not yet known the learning style of that student. Nobody's born without having, um, every child has their own unique quality. So I don't believe any child is no good. I just believe that I, as a teacher, have not identified that student's learning style. So it's now my job to identify how that student learns. For example, if I come and talk and talk and talk, probably that student doesn't learn that way. Maybe the student learns by actually seeing it happen. So having to identify that student's learning style is how I deal with them. And once you identify it, wonderful. The student learns easily. Thank if, you, ma'am. If, if, if at all, if you want to enter the first day, and on the first day of your new class, so how many days you would you like to take to assess the levels of the students? Would you like to take one week or two days or three days? It depends on the class. Then, you know, in my own school, you follow your students. 
for example, I take a student from SS1, I take them from SS1 to SS2 to SS3, so I already understand them as I'm going. But for a new class, it might take me probably a week to actually understand everybody. Yeah, me too. So, Therapia, over to you. Yes, sir. Hi, ma'am. Hello. My name is Tekia. I'm studying grade. My hobbies are reading books and playing games. My life and business is to become a software engineer. Can I, can I ask you a question, ma'am? Of course you can. The topics. Actually, you have uh, written so many articles on education-based learning. Okay, okay, okay. Could you please share some more? Okay, I've written articles. Okay, I've written articles on open schooling. That's one article I've written. And open schooling talks about we have, for example, in Nigeria, we have over 10.3 million out of school children. So what happens to them? Yes, we have students in the school. What happens to them? So I kind of made a suggestion that we could do open schooling. For example, we have physical classrooms. After the students have left in the evening. They can be utilized to teach children that are out of school. So that was one article I wrote on open schooling. I wrote an article on mental health because mental health is something that is frowned on in developing nations. We don't really talk about it. We don't really talk about it. So, and we have a lot of teenagers that are dealing with mental health issues. So I wrote an article on that and how to address it. I've also written an article on how to um, innovative, methodologies we can use in secondary schools, where I talked about um, leveraging on lecture capture. In fact, lecture capture actually started from India <laughs> because I had a research on it. It started from India where um, they were videoing the lessons from schools that were high paying and they were taking those videos to underserved communities in India and actually showing them. So lecture capture is something I also advise for Nigeria. I talked about using gamification which I'm also doing using games and all that. So I've written articles on some of this education and also on open educational resource, how we can utilize open educational resource specifically for my district. I wrote a paper on that. Okay, that's very cool. Stephanie, I have a few questions, set of questions. So I have okay. seen the video that you have forwarded and the Facebook uh, pictures. So most of your, your students, they have the specific uniform. They have the specific uniform. And yes. uh, it looks like your student, your school is a, a bit the private school and the way that your school looks like. But you, are, you have- you, you No, it's a public school. You have a public school. And uh, so most of our schools these days are the getting transformed uh, the way they used to look like. And today, our, most of the public schools uh, they are far ahead of uh, private schools. Private schools. Yeah. It should be taken by the local governments. And at the same time, the, the government also is uh, insisting uh, lots of training to the teachers. So could you please tell us something about uh, the infrastructure facilities that your school have? And uh, do, does the government of uh, your, your region uh, provide the school uniform or test books or uh, uh, do you have the free meal scheme in your school? Could you please? <laughs> okay, so um, my school is a public school, first and foremost. And my school is located in Lagos State. So, of course, it's funded by the Lagos State government. Um, the Lagos State government provides free education. So education in secondary schools, from secondary school downwards, is free. Um, we provide a structure. I'm sorry you saw the structure. You thought it was a private school. It's actually a public school. So it's provided by the government. The uniform the students have to buy, but sometimes the books are also provided by the government. But the one of three meals, no, 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 <laughs> that one for now, it's not, it's not part of what the government provides. But basic things, um, then for example, the terminal examination, the WIAC examination, that's the West African um, examination for SS3 students, that's grade 12 students it's actually paid by the government. So the Lagos State government is doing so much for public schools. But the issue is this, the population is much. So despite the facilities that is being provided, it, some of the time is not, is barely adequate for the large population, but the government is really, is really trying its best to to be able to provide for all our students. I, I also, I also, 
felt that uh, the students' levels in English is uh, far ahead of uh, some of the schools of uh, my region. So how do you teach, how do, you, how do the, 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 the school English teachers teach the English language? And do you have any strict rules regarding the, the medium of instruction in your school? Are the students restricted to speak only in English within the four walls of the classroom? And do you have anything? And please share about that. Okay, so Nigeria, the official language of Nigeria is English. So the mode of instruction in schools from primary, secondary to whatever is English. So of course, it's going to, the students are going to speak better English. Though we have um, days that um, we have to speak our mother tongue, for example, Wednesday. So you have to speak the language of that particular region on assembly and all that. But in the classroom, students are expected to speak in English because we notice that if they speak in English, you know, practice makes perfect. The more they speak in English, the better they become. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, because in India, I think, especially in my region, I think we have many practical issues. Uh, most of the students, they, they prefer to switch over to their mother tongue, uh, even though I insist there. But uh, some students, uh, they try to speak with their friends, uh, even uh, outside the classroom. So, so it's all about uh, their, uh, maybe their mindset, the, how value they think that uh, English is. So before we end this session, could you please give a message to my students? And these kids actually are now on uh, vacation, summer vacation. And uh, even though we are on, uh, we are out of the school for summer vacation, but these students are attending the classes uh, quite regularly because they are so passionate about learning something new. And okay. they are so keen to develop their uh, communicative skills. So could you please uh, give them an inspirational message? Okay, okay, okay. Hello, children. I just wanted to say this. I believe you are blessed and you are privileged to have this type of opportunity and to have this type of teacher that is innovative, that wants you to reach out and who actually wants to make the world a global village. So my advice to you is make use of, make best use of this opportunity. You are having the opportunity to have connection-based learning. You have the opportunity to learn from diverse cultures, diverse people, diverse perspective. So make the best out of it. Another thing I want to say is try to be more or aspire to be more. And how can you do that? By having a growth mindset. What you learned yesterday is not enough for what the challenge is for today. Keep on going, keep on learning. That is one thing. And that thing is for a 21st century student or a 21st century person that is going to work in the future, you must learn how to collaborate. In Nigeria, most of the time, what we have is competition. This age is not the age of competition, this is the age of collaboration. Work as a team, learn and be more. That is my, my message for you today. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for your time. And uh, we have been waiting for your session for almost one month. 